The disparity between our predictions and observed outcomes in the field of complexity is perhaps the largest disparity I know of that has been termed understanding. We remain continually surprised at the law of unintended consequences in our dealings with complex systems in social sciences, financial markets, global ecosystems and biology. Even in relatively simple physical systems, which I would describe as complicated but not complex, our ability to predict new phenomena is woefully inadequate. Yet it is probably fair to say that public interest in complexity studies has never been higher and the genuine scientific challenges could not be more serious or more, press or more pressing for society at large. Amidst the sea of overused buzzwords and so-called paradigms that form the rhetoric of popular science articles on complexity, perhaps no word is more overused than emergence, and perhaps not since chaos theory became a household term, has a genuine scientific concept been more broadly popularised and used as a deus ex machina in speculative thinking. I've been asked to provide an introduction to emergence and collective phenomena in equilibrium and non-equilibrium systems within the context of the forthcoming NAS Keck Futures Initiative on complexity. This talk is intended to be broadly accessible, but I hope that even experts will learn something new here either from the viewpoint expressed or from the examples I've chosen to illustrate the key concepts. Complex systems characterised by the presence of strong fluctuations, unpredictable and nonlinear dynamics, multiple scales of space and time, and frequently some sort of emergent structure, think riots or herds if you like. The individual components of complex systems are so tightly coupled that they cannot usefully be analysed in isolation, rendering irrelevant traditional reductionist approaches to science, obscuring causal relationships and distinguishing complexity from mere complication. Biological complexity, or biocomplexity, arises from the inclusion of active components, nested feedback loops, and multiple layers of system dynamics. It's relevant to numerous aspects of the biological, medical and earth sciences, including the dynamics of ecosystems, societal interactions and the functioning of organisms. In the natural development of the sciences, issues of complexity are sensibly postponed until they can no longer be avoided. Thus, it is no surprise that numerous disciplines from science, engineering, biology and medicine are facing fundamental obstacles of a similar nature, as their natural intellectual development inevitably encounters the barrier of complexity. At the same time, a number of factors raise the stakes for successful and useful understanding of complexity issues, including society's increased dependence on complex communication networks, the enormous public interest in tackling diseases of complexity, such as cancer, and the challenge of comprehending the dynamics of the biosphere, thus ensuring an appropriate response to global climate change. I'd like to start by making a key distinction between emergence per se and complexity. Much of what I will say in this tutorial has been understood for many years and was set down by Philip Anderson in a very influential paper entitled More is Different. The point is that as the number of degrees of freedom, be they atoms, active agents, abstract dynamical variables, or whatever, becomes large, new phenomena arise because of the possibility of constructing hierarchies of levels within a system. Now, we don't need to look to complex systems to see this, and so I will start by considering the simplest physical system you can imagine a bunch of identical atoms bouncing around inside a box in thermal equilibrium. So what do we expect to see? Well, the answer depends upon the temperature. At high temperatures, the atoms will be in a fluid state, either gaseous or liquid. But at low temperatures, the atoms form a solid, in particular a crystalline solid. Solids resist infinitesimal static shear and so can be said to possess a shear modulus. Crystalline solids also have the atoms arranged in a periodic array, 
that is frequently modelled in elementary textbooks, as a lattice of atoms connected by springs. So we have two models, at high temperature an ideal gas of particles, and at low temperatures a lattice of atoms connected and held together. Now, the interesting thing about this seemingly prosaic phenomenon is that there is actually no difference in the underlying physics of the fluid and the solid states. There are, in reality, no springs. The statistical mechanics of the system is governed by the expression for the total energy, made up of the kinetic energy and the potential energy. The microscopic forces between the atoms are the same at high temperatures and at low temperatures. So, how can we have two phases of matter then? when lowering the temperature has not changed the interactions between the atoms. Actually, uh, this point uh, was confusing to physicists as late as 1937, when it was disputed and, in fact, uh, put to a vote at a conference of statistical mechanicians. Now, the point is that although uh, the interactions did not change as we lowered the temperature, the correlations between the atoms did. Correlations measure the statistical distribution of the density fluctuations, at least in this case, whereas by interactions we mean the actual forces between the atoms. So the solid state emerged as if by magic from the fluid state, even though the underlying physics did not change. This is the phenomenon of emergence. So what's the, uh, what's the uh, big deal uh, about emergence? Well, remember those springs in that simple model of the crystalline solid. They represent new long-range forces that are completely distinct from the actual forces between atoms. In fact, on a large scale, we have the phenomenon of elasticity. The elastic response of a solid is very different from that of a liquid. The origin of the elasticity and its characterization in terms of elastic constants such as the shear modulus, is the collective statistical behaviour of the underlying atoms. So is this really what we mean by new laws of physics? Well, I would claim that they are as real as any other laws of physics. For example, at the level of description of continuum mechanics, that's all you see. In fact, only in the last hundred years or so have we had the ability to look at a lower level of description and see that the laws of continuum matter arise from the underlying statistical behaviour of the atomic constituents. At the level of continuum mechanics, the shear modulus is a phenomenological parameter which depends on the material in question. With access to a lower level of description, we can, in principle, compute the shear modulus from our description in terms of atoms and their interatomic forces. So, of course, uh, this is not new to science. We see the same pattern of different levels of description when we start with atoms, or we look at chemistry, for example. In fact, it would be very strange if we had to worry about the mass of the top quark in order to do chemistry. So this idea of emergent levels of description, absorbing the properties of lower levels into phenomenological parameters, is a familiar and natural one. Indeed, one that allows us to do science at all. A corollary of this is what might be termed uh, is that what might be termed fundamental physics is going to be hard, because it goes against the flow of emergence. Emergence is the enemy of reductionism. Now that's the bad news. The good news is that one can isolate appropriately chosen levels of description and focus on these to understand the collective properties of matter without having to worry about the physics all the way down. In a world where you did need to understand the processes contributing to the top quark mass, for example, in order to do chemistry, Scientific investigation would have proceeded very differently indeed, probably grinding to a halt at the get-go. I'm going to argue later that this can and should be exploited in the way that we model complex systems.
Before we get to complex systems per se, I would like to comment on an important characteristic of emergence. It is associated with loss of uniqueness. By this, I mean that in the context of our atoms in a box example, the fluid state is still a logically allowed possibility at low temperatures. But it turns out not to be very likely, and becomes increasingly unlikely as the number of atoms gets large. So, there is some sort of bifurcation or phase transition happening, as the temperature or other control parameter is varied. The emergent states that arise have their own collective phenomena, and by now many interesting examples are known to condensed matter physicists. These include crystals, magnets, superconductors, quantum Hall states. Beyond equilibrium, I want to mention the possibility of fluid turbulence and life itself as having characteristics of emergence. Even supposedly fundamental interactions, such as gravity, have been proposed to be emergent. I want to talk now about the nature of the relationship between emergence and complexity. It should be clear from what I have said that we can have emergence without complexity. So let's consider this by positioning a variety of systems on a one-dimensional axis which we will take to be a proxy for the number of levels of hierarchy that are needed to account for the system. We'll start at the very small, at the left end of this uh, view graph, we'll start at the very small with atomic physics and then move on to the world of condensed matter physics, then make a big jump to living cells, biofilms, multicellularity, ecosystems, social systems, uh, economic systems, and so on. I think most people would agree with the ordering principle suggested here, even if we've been rather vague about the precise quantification. Equally, I think that most people would agree that complexity begins somewhere between condensed matter physics and cell biology, and that emergence is a good characterization of the distinction between atomic and condensed matter physics. But is that really true? Let's blow up the line around atomic physics. Rather than being the start, it is, of course, just another level of description, sitting above nuclear physics, quarks, and gluons, and eventually more speculative things such as strings. Equally clearly, emergent phenomena arise well below the atomic level. For example, for atomic physicists, the nucleus is a point mass, whereas for the high-energy physicist, it is a seething mass of collective degrees of freedom from quantum chromodynamics. And maybe even the so-called fundamental physics of strings is emergent, with a discovery in recent years of non-uniqueness on a massive scale in the possible states of string theory. So we have the possibility that the most fundamental interactions might themselves be emergent. Let's turn now to some of the signatures of emergence. I want to briefly make connections to other key ideas that you will hear about, scaling laws, fluctuations, and phase transitions. We're going to start with a simple fluid, whose phase diagram in the pressure-temperature plane is shown in this diagram here. The transition between fluid and solid is always a first-order one, except in the case of disordered polymer systems, such as rubbers and gels, that we're not discussing uh, in this example. The transition between liquid and gas is first order also, but it ends at a critical point. Beyond that, it is possible to go continuously and smoothly between gas and liquid states without encountering a thermodynamic singularity of any form. In fact, that is why we often lump them together into the catch-all word fluid. To, uh, to make the uh, transition between them continuously without encountering any singularities, you have to increase the temperature, increase the pressure, and then reduce the temperature again to go round the critical point. Now, how do we see this in the lab? Well, near the critical point, 
uh, the surface tension at the boundary between a liquid and a gas vanishes. And so the meniscus itself vanishes, and at, at the critical point there is no uh, distinction, no observational boundary between the gas and the liquid. If we were to take a microscopic snapshot of the system at temperatures approaching the critical temperature from above, what we'd see is shown in this picture here. We'd see patches of liquid embedded in patches of gas and vice versa, with the size of the patches growing as the critical temperature is approached. In this picture here, the black is meant to represent the high density regions, the liquid regions, and the white is meant to represent the low density or gas regions. Very close to the critical temperature, you can see that the system is experiencing strong uh, density fluctuations as it samples the two states which emerge below the critical temperature. And in fact, right at the critical point, the system is scale invariant, with patches of liquid embedded in patches of gas that are embedded in patches of liquid, and so on and so forth. These fluctuations have many interesting ramifications. But here I want to mention an aspect that does not seem to get as much attention as power law scaling, and that is the phenomenon of data collapse near the critical point. Now, power law scaling is the manifestation of the sort of self-similarity uh, that I told you about a, a minute ago. That is, if you look at the system on an arbitrary scale, uh, you won't be able to tell what the scale bar is. Now, what we're going to talk about is data collapse. So let me now try to explain that to you. For variety, I want you to think now not of a liquid gas system, but of a magnet. A magnet exhibits a spontaneous magnetization as an emergent property below the critical temperature. In the uh, picture, that I've, the, in the view graph that you can see here, uh, the magnetization is denoted by the variable m and temperature by the variable t, and h represents the external magnetic field. Now, uh, what happens in a magnet is that at atomic dipoles in the material interact with dipoles in their vicinity, and they try to align with them. At low enough temperatures, the gain in internal energy by doing this outweighs the loss of orientational entropy, and the dipoles like to spontaneously align, lowers the energy, also lowers the free energy. The emergent property in this case, then, is what is called spin wave stiffness. If you could grab hold of a single dipole and twist it, all the other dipoles in the magnet would change direction too, as long as you're in the magnetic phase. But this would not happen in the high temperature phase, where there is no spontaneous ordering. If you just twisted one of the dipoles inside the magnet, a long way away, none of the other dipoles would respond at all. This, in fact, is completely analogous to what happens in the liquid gas system. If you perturb the atoms in a box by poking them with your finger, for example, then this is what will happen. In the liquid state, your finger will just go straight in. But in the solid state, your finger won't go straight in. In fact, it will be resisted, and you can push all the atoms in the system. In other words, you can push the entire solid along with your finger. That itself is a wonderful example of an emergent phenomenon. The magnetic analog of that, as I've said, is called spin wave stiffness. Now, the magnetization should depend on temperature and also on whether or not there is an external magnetic field applied. That means that there are really two external variables that control the magnetization. Now, it turns out that near the transition point, near the critical point, near the critical temperature, only one variable controls the system, a strange non-analytic combination of temperature and external magnetic field. And this was uh, pointed out first uh, by, uh, by Widham in, in 1963. He looked at how the magnetization, in a sense, varied near the critical point, as a power law in fact. He looked at how the magnetization depended on external magnetic field at the critical point, that's the critical isotherm scaling, and he showed that both of these results 
both of these observations resulted from a single similarity formula, which you can see on the view graph there. Now, uh, th th you can see this uh, in the experimental data uh, shown here, which are collected from a review article by Stanley in 1999. You can see that the spontaneous magnetization, the magnetization is a function of two variables, h and t, but it's a function of only a single variable near the critical point. That is, all the data, when plotted in, appro in appropriate scaled magnetization units and scaled temperature units, all the data for different external fields, h, and different temperatures, t, which would normally fill a plane, actually collapses down onto one universal curve. Now, this is a big deal, and moreover, the functional form of this curve is universal. You can see here from the view graph that this doesn't depend on what types of atoms are in the magnet. So whether the, uh, the material is, uh, is, is nickel or European oxide or whatever, uh, when you plot the data in the scaling regime in the way that theory uh, predicts, uh, all the data collapse onto a single scaling function, the one that can be computed using a very simple minimal model of a magnet. Now, I want to move away from simple equilibrium physical systems. And I want to describe some new results in non-equilibrium systems and then talk a little bit about living systems. I want to start with turbulence. Turbulence has sometimes been called the last great unsolved problem of classical physics, which is true, but we're not yet dealing with a truly complex system. Now, here's a picture of turbulence, a sketch uh, that I'm sure you have seen before uh, by Leonardo da Vinci, shown here uh, in negative for clarity. What you can see here is a variety of rather fanciful impressions of emergent phenomena. The emergent phenomena, sometimes called coherent structures in the fluid mechanics community, are these sort of swirly vortices that you can see here, sketched on a wide variety of scales. In fact, this is not just an artistic impression, but it's a basic insight that was more quantitatively developed by Richardson and later Kolmogorov and others in the 20th century, and that is the idea of the turbulent cascade, the idea that energy gets transmitted from large scales down to small scales by the splitting up of uh, eddies into smaller and smaller eddies uh, without uh, dissipation being involved in the dynamics of that process. Now, although it's been studied for uh, uh, almost a hundred years and there have been many, many experiments uh, in this field, I want to talk uh, here about a rather unglamorous experiment that was carried out in the 1930s by Nicaragua. Although seemingly prosaic, it actually is one of the most important experiments uh, yet done in turbulence uh, because of the way it was done and the systematic nature uh, in, of the experiment. Nicaragua was interested in the following important question. How much pressure drop is there across a pipe in order to get the fluid to flow at a particular rate? Now, it turns out that the drag of a rapidly flowing fluid is not controlled simply by the viscosity, as you might have thought by extrapolating from considering flowing honey, for example. Instead, the uh, turbulence itself introduces a new and limiting form of drag which Nicaragua uh, measured in his uh, experiments. Uh, in fact, uh, if you were, were to calculate uh, by simple arguments the speed of any flowing river, such as uh, uh, the Amazon or the Volga or the Nile, uh, based on the height drop between the source and the end, if you uh, ignored the effects of turbulence, you would get a flow speed uh, orders of magnitude different from what is the actual uh, uh, speed itself. So turbulence uh, is, uh, is the most important uh, form uh, for drag in flowing fluids. Now Nicaragua realized that the drag depended not just on the fluid speed, but also the roughness of the walls of the pipe. And so he varied both the fluid speed and the roughness 
systematically and obtained a complicated sequence of results for the friction factor, which I'll show you on the next view graph. How did he vary the roughness? Well, what he did was uh, he glued uh, sand grains, which he had sieved to get a uniform size, he glued those onto the sides of his pipe and then did various experiments with uh, different sizes of pipe uh, in order to systematically vary the ratio between the size of the sand grains and the width pipe. So here is the result that he obtained from his experiments. On the vertical axis is plotted the dimensionless friction factor, which you can basically think of as the pressure drop uh, per unit length along the pipe. On the horizontal axis is the uh, Reynolds number, uh, which is really uh, a normalized version of the fluid speed. And then uh, Nicaragua did this for pipes of varying roughnesses. And uh, you can see that there's a sequence of curves here. The smoothest curves are at the bottom and the uh, roughest curves are at the, at the top. You can see that there's a variety of uh, different flow regimes here. The laminar flow regime, outlined in purple, uh, is, uh, is, is not a turbulent regime. The uh, flow is, is a simple type of Stokes flow. Then there is a transition to uh, turbulence, and uh, that occurs at a Reynolds number of about 1,000, or the logarithm of about uh, 3.6 or so. Uh, and then the uh, drag actually decreases from then and then uh, goes through a spoon or belly-shaped uh, non-monotonic variation until ultimately uh, becoming a Reynolds number uh, independent at large Reynolds numbers, at large flow speeds. And a variety of different regimes are outlined on this curve. Uh, they have different uh, scalings uh, associated with them, scalings of the friction factor with the Reynolds number and with the roughness R. So the main thing I want to talk about for present purposes is not the precise uh, power laws that, uh, that I, you can see on this, uh, on this, on this graph, uh, but that the fact that in the turbulent regime, the friction factor uh, is a function of two variables. It's a two-parameter family of curves. It depends upon the Reynolds number and it depends upon the roughness. Now, by using arguments uh, analogous exactly to those for the magnetic critical point phenomenon, uh, we discovered that uh, turbulence actually exhibits very well the data collapse property we saw in magnets. A single variable composed of the wall roughness and the fluid flow speed controls the friction. The graph on the left here shows how the data for the friction factor collapse using the results from a simple mean field picture of turbulence due to Kolmogorov that does not properly take into account fluctuations. Just as in the magnetic case here, the key is to make up a combination of variables made up of the friction factor, the Reynolds number and the roughness, in such a way that the two-parameter family of curves that fill the whole plane all collapse onto a universal curve. The uh, the uh, mean field picture does not properly take into account uh, fluctuations, but one can uh, work out what the effect of these fluctuations would be, and an improved data collapse is shown in the right panel. Now, the underlying physics of this is partially understood, but of course, a full explanation of turbulence remains an exciting and open problem. So I want to end by talking a little about emergence and biological complexity. So why do we care about emergence in biology? Well, I want to uh, uh, read to you a, uh, a, a quote from uh, Stephen Jay Gould, uh, who was writing uh, a few days after the announcement of the first draft sequence of the human genome writing in the New York, New York Times on February 19, 2001. Now, you might have thought that this occasion uh, would be one for much backpatting and smugness. After all, this was the apotheosis of the molecular biology revolution. But Stephen Jay Gould's tone was rather different. 
The reason, the shocking result, that humans have far fewer genes than had been widely expected, not many more than the simplest roundworm possesses. He wrote that Homo sapiens possesses between 30,000 and 40,000 genes, which we now know is a bit of an overestimate. In other words, our bodies develop under the directing influence of only half again as many genes as a tiny roundworm. He went on to write, The collapse of the doctrine of one gene for one protein and one direction of causal flow, from basic codes to elaborate totality, marks the failure of reductionism for the complex system that we call biology. And he presently recognised that the key to complexity is not more genes, but more combinations and interactions generated by fewer units of code. And many of these interactions, as emergent properties, to use the technical jargon, must be explained at the level of their appearance, for they cannot be predicted from the separate underlying parts alone. In other words, what he's saying is that it is the collective interactions between the genes uh, which give emergent properties uh, that are responsible to, for the uh, complexity of life and, the, and, the, and, uh, and humans, homo sapiens. In effect, what uh, Gould was calling for was the development of a statistical mechanics of genes, something that we and others have indeed been pursuing. So what does bring molecules to life? How can emergent concepts assist in understanding life, if at all? One answer is in the way that we model phenomena. To explain my point, I need to show you one uncontestable example of where the modeling technique I espouse will work. I want to show you that it does work and explain why. And then I'll switch back to biology. My example is superconductivity, the dramatic drop to zero of the resistance of a material when it gets below a critical temperature. Shown here are some early data on the high temperature superconductor yttrium barium copper oxide, uh, data taken in uh, Don Ginsberg's lab at Illinois. And you can see here that at about uh, 90 degrees Kelvin, uh, the resistivity that is plotted on the vertical axis uh, drops to a value indistinguishable from zero. In the inset of the graph, you can see a sketch of uh, the rather complicated uh, crystal structure of this uh, class of materials. Now, my point about superconductivity is that it's not about the atoms. Why not? Well, the example I want to use is the bardeen cooper schrieffer theory of superconductivity. It's the most successful many-body theory developed, and it's had a profound impact not only on condensed matter physics, but on nuclear physics, astrophysics, and even high-energy physics. Amongst its many spectacular predictions are that an emergent feature in the theory associated with the superconductivity is related to the critical temperature by a simple constant, 3.53. This, uh, this uh, feature is, is something called the energy gap. It is the, the ratio, 3.53, is the same for all materials to which the theory is applicable. And you can see plotted on the uh, right-hand uh, top panel uh, th a graph of the ratio of the uh, energy gap uh, uh, over Tc, and you can see that the uh, result is a straight line uh, with a slope 3.5, 7 over 2, uh, exactly as predicted uh, by the theory. The theory also predicts accurately the way in which this energy gap emerges as the temperature is reduced below the critical temperature. So in the lower panel, you can see the energy gap as a function of temperature below Tc rising continuously from zero in a way that is uh, very accurately predicted by the theory. So the important thing here is that we have very spectacular agreement with uh, the universal ratios and a universal function such as the energy gap delta of t. And the predictions, just like the scaling formula for the magnetization, are the same for all materials to which the theory applies. It's universal. It doesn't depend upon the material. The only place in where the material properties enter is in the critical temperature t. But the most remarkable thing about this amazingly successful theory 
is that it leaves out most of the physics and all of the chemistry. There are no atoms, no phonons and no electronic band structure, at least in the simplest form of the theory that works. Only hopping electrons that are allowed to pair. The essence of the theory is the collective behaviour of the quantum gas of electrons. Cooperativity is the essence. Now, earlier I made a very cryptic comment that we must ask the right questions, but I didn't say what I meant. Here's what I meant. If you ask not for the ratio of the energy gap to the critical temperature, but instead ask us to predict the critical temperature, Tc, in Kelvin directly, well, that is a very hard, almost impossible task. We have a very poor ability to do that, and the simple textbook form of BCS theory is not adequate for this task. So, only some properties, and typically they, these turn out to be ratios or normalizable probability distributions, only some of those properties uh, are universal. Other properties are material dependent, and that's where uh, physics loses its ability to make accurate uh, parameter-free predictions. So what is the moral of this story? The moral is that we should focus on the process, but not the particular realization. Now here's what I mean. The process in superconductivity is the quantum dynamics of correlated electrons. The realization is what you do in the lab to make electrons and atoms that are an example of that process. So in this particular example, it was mixing up the yttrium, barium, copper and oxygen in, in order to create uh, the superconductor in the first place. So to understand superconductivity, you won't get there by thinking just about the atoms. You have to understand their cooperative behavior. That's why the phenomenon of superconductivity took 50 years to solve, because by just focusing on the obvious degrees of freedom, uh, you can never understand uh, the cooperative behavior. You have to understand, first of all, the cooperativity, the collective effect. So superconductivity, it's not about the atoms. And life? Life is not about the molecules. Here, the process that we're talking about is the process of evolution. And the realization is the mixture of carbon, oxygen, hydrogen, nitrogen, etc. that are used to create living matter here on Earth. It's likely that one cannot explain life just by thinking, in a reductionist way, about atoms and molecules. To understand what brings molecules to life, we need to focus on their cooperative behaviour. So, what does matter for early life? Well, its cooperative effects, as you might expect, and our group at Illinois is one of several that are focused on collective phenomena in the microbial world in particular. To us, think dynamic is what's known as horizontal gene transfer. That means uh, transfer of genes are not through uh, descendants, but between uh, unrelated organisms. So here I've, is, a, is a sketch of a horizontal gene transfer with genetic material being transferred between microbes through a variety of biological processes. And I've shown you here the most uh, important of these, uh, the exchange by viruses known as transduction, conjugation, uh, where the, uh, the microbes make a little tube between them called a pilus and uh, transfer uh, uh, plasmids, little rings of DNA, and also transfection or transformation, the uptake of free DNA uh, from the environment. Now this process uh, was discovered uh, over 50 years ago. So the important question is not what, how does it happen for individual pairs of microbes, but what happens when they all do it? What happens when all the microbes are busy exchanging genetic material in this horizontal fashion rather than in a sort of vertical uh, 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 transmission of genes that we are more used to thinking about? Well, there are many interesting consequences, and I've only got time to mention just a couple here. One consequence is an absolute catastrophe for medical science. It's the decline in effectiveness of antibiotic drugs through the spread of genes that confer antibiotic resistance to microbes. We now know 
that uh, that uh, genes that help a microbe survive antibiotics are now being spread or have been spread between distantly related bacteria across physical locations and these genes are being expressed and here's an example in this uh, in this figure here of a resistance genes uh, that have been found in a variety of distantly related uh, organisms this is a major a problem. Another but uh, uh, more fascinating uh, and less uh, perturbing uh, finding is a very recent finding from marine microbial ecology uh, and documented by uh, Penny Chisholm's group at MIT and others. And this is the finding of the transfer of genes back and forth between marine cyanobacteria and their phages. So uh, in, in this uh, in this uh, picture here, uh, we're focusing on cyanophages, uh, viruses that infect photosynthetic marine bacteria. And uh, the phylogenetic chart on the right uh, documents how uh, genes, a particular gene, uh, has uh, been transferred back and forth uh, between uh, the viruses and the uh, and the, um, and the In fact, uh, we can ask the question, uh, is there a benefit to microbes of viruses? And indeed, rather than supporting the traditional view of the relationship between microbes and viruses as being a predator-prey relationship, the new findings suggest that there are collective benefits to both microbes and viruses through gene exchange, with the uh, creation of an effective global reservoir of genetic diversity that profoundly influences the dynamics of the major marine ecosystems. So uh, Sullivan et al. write that host-like genes acquired by phages undergo a period of diversification in phage genomes and serve as a genetic reservoir for their hosts. A complex picture of overlapping phage and host gene pools emerges with genetic exchange across these pools leading to evolutionary change for host and for phage. So as many people have, uh, have uh, suggested and speculated for many uh, years, microbe-phage interactions create a global reservoir of genes that benefit both microbes and phages. The full consequence of this uh, uh, for, for uh, the marine uh, microbial ecology, for global climate change and so on, uh, that remains to be seen. My last example from biology is uh, drawn from our own work and addresses the question of the evolution of the genetic code. The genetic code is a shorthand for the process of translation, the mapping from triplet codons on DNA or RNA into the amino acids that make up proteins. In the canonical codon table shown here, uh, the, amino, the amino acids of life are not arranged randomly as one might expect if the code was a frozen accident. By that I mean a snapshot of the precursor organism to all life on Earth. Instead, the amino acids are arranged in a pattern related to their degree of hydrophobicity and polarity. This has the effect that the code has evolved in a way to minimize the effect of translation errors. So what do I mean by that? Well, an error in translation with this genetic code table will most likely produce an amino acid with properties close to those of the correct amino acid. So how could such a code emerge when any change to the code would necessarily be fatal? If you change the genetic code, if it evolved or mutated, then uh, the organisms would uh, clearly not survive. Well, the answer to this conundrum is that the code uh, can evolve if we suppose that early life required much less precision than modern life forms. So just as a modern automobile is a result of highly refined engineering practices, but the first automobiles were rather humble and could be readily built by a single inventor. If early life was tolerant of amino acid substitutions, then it is relatively straightforward to construct a dynamical system model of the co-evolution of the genetic code along with the distribution of proteins of life. Selection acts only on the phenotype, by which we mean the proteins, but this is reflected in a variation of the code itself. 
So we did computer simulations of this, and a surprising discovery came from these simulations. What we did was simulate digital life, evolving, replicating, and competing entities of code, computer code, living inside a computer. We found that only if there were collective phenomena arising from the horizontal exchange of genes would genetic code evolution lead to a universal and optimally error-minimizing code. So shown here is a, is a measure of how optimal the code is in terms of minimizing error. And I'm not going to go into the precise details of what this measure is or how these uh, simulations were done. The main point I want you to notice is that there are two graphs here, one in red without horizontal gene transfer and one in blue. On the vertical axis is the quality of the code, its error minimization property, and on the, on the horizontal axis is time. You can see that the evolution of the code follows this pattern, that without horizontal gene transfer it eventually locks in to a particular code quality and never uh, evolves in any highly optimal way. On the other hand, the blue curves evolve to a state that is highly optimal and, uh, and uh, in the next view graph is unique. That is, with horizontal gene transfer, uh, one gets a unique genetic code, whereas without, without horizontal gene transfer, uh, the code is not unique. You get uh, competing communities of uh, different uh, genetic codes and you never get one code that wins in all. What we learn from these simulations is that without collective effects, the genetic code would not evolve nearly enough to be consistent with its observed optimality. And we now have a way to quantify the observed optimality of the code, uh, which I won't describe, but that starts with work from uh, Hagen Hurst uh, back in the early 1990s. The level of modeling that we were able to do here is indeed rather crude. We left out many things just as the BCS theory of superconductivity ignored atoms, phonons, and other elements of realism, so our models ignore chemistry and biochemistry, focusing purely on the collective effects and what we believe to be the appropriate dynamical degrees of freedom. Yet we believe that this is a valid, and indeed the right level of description, on which to model evolution and its emergent consequences. So let me summarize what I've told you today. The key take-home point is that emergence arises in large systems due to sufficiently strong interactions between the constituents. The emergent state is a collective one, exhibiting novel characteristics and responses to external perturbations. It loses memory of many of the details of the underlying level of description. The onset of emergence is often associated with continuous phase transitions and scaling phenomena, and examples abound in physics, biology, and beyond.